Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Pushpa Sandarajan. I'm a I've been a registered dietitian for over 30 years, and I'm very happy to see so many people interested in the subject today. Um, and uh, I, I'm also a certified yoga teacher, and I got into um, Ayurveda about a few years ago. I just wanted to give you a little bit of introduction before we get started on the topic itself. Um, I got into Ayurveda about um, six, seven years ago, and I have found it so wonderful in my practice, and I've been in private practice for the last four years as a dietitian, and I do use a lot of principles of Ayurveda in my, um, my, uh, my, my counseling and things like that. Um, could you all please mute yourself so that there's no uh, disturbance? Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the proper view. Okay. All right. Okay. So I've been in um, practice for about four years now as a dietitian and uh, And, and Ayurveda is actually my passion. And so we just launched, actually I have here with me Gauri Janarkar, who is, uh, is my co-host today. And she's going to be moderating the Q&A session and letting people in to join. Uh, and she's also a classically trained Vaidya from India and she practices in Dallas. She's also a dietitian like me. So we are very happy to be here and I am so excited about talking about this topic on six uh, days and, and having studied Ayurveda, um, being trained in that and actually I'm finishing my practitioner training with Ananda Ayurveda Academy in, in Willowbrook, Illinois right now. And I have learned so much and it has really boosted my practice as a dietitian. Um, gives gave me like a common sense approach to helping people. So I'm very happy to be here. And I hope uh, at the end of the session, you learn a lot of things. Couple of housekeeping, please keep yourself muted at all, at all times. And I'll do my talk for about an hour and then we'll have about half an hour to 45 minutes at the end for some questions if you have anything. And you can always put those in the chat box and then Gaudi will keep looking at them and then she will ask me at the end. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and, okay, here we go. and Okay, here we go. Okay, so today's topic is six days on Ayurveda and uh, health and healing with food and spices. So first of all, some a disclosure, I have no financial disclosure or conflicts of interest with the presented material. And also disclaimer I wanted to say is information presented here in this webinar is for educational purposes only. But of course, you will definitely learn a lot of things that you can apply to your own lives. Um, so first I wanted to give you a brief overview of what Ayurveda is. I know, I know a lot of people, if you're from India, you might have heard of the word or even here you could have heard because yoga is very popular in, the country, in this country. So naturally Ayurveda is also gaining popularity. And, um, but then, um, but people have different notions of what Ayurveda is. And usually I get asked, so where do you get your herbs? What kind of herbs you get and things? So a lot of people have this concept, it's an herbal medicine. But really speaking, 80% of Ayurveda is all about diet and lifestyle first. And then only after that, we you know, prescribe herbs or anything like, like that, although they are natural. So the word Ayurveda actually means Ayur and Veda, which means, um, um, Gauri, can you make sure, oh wait, hold on one second. You know what, I just wanna make sure I'm recording this. Sorry, let me just get out of here for now. Yeah, I'm recording. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so coming back to the subject. So Ayur means life and Veda means science. So it is a science of life and it is applicable to everybody uh, in, in uh, all beings. And the concept of Ayurveda is, um, and again, I'm going to just share a few sutras. It's not going to be all Sanskrit, just one slide. I'm going to have that because it's kind of important to to convey that message properly, more authentically. So yada pinde tada brahmande. So it is believed in Ayurveda that everything that you see in the universe is, you, are, you have that inside of you. Every individual is just like the universe. And we are constantly interacting with the universe. So when we are in harmony with the, with the, with the surroundings and all everything around us, then we actually feel more healthy. So this is the concept of Ayurveda. Now the dictionary definition of Ayurveda is it's an alternative medicine. 
Uh, it's a traditional system of medicine coming from India, which integrates body, mind, and spirit, using a comprehensive holistic approach, uh, emphasizing diet, herbal remedies, exercise, meditation, breathing. I would also add yoga to that. So definitely it's a very holistic approach to health and healing. And again, uh, to give you a little bit background about history about uh, Ayurveda, this was actually uh, found in the Vedas. It was conceived thousands of years ago by our sages, who were the scientists of the Vedic period. And they, uh, they actually, uh, there is a, the main textbook is called Charaka Samhita. Um, so Charaka Acharya actually took it from the Vedas, compiled it into these Samhitas, and gave them in the form of sutras. And of course, there are uh, modern translations of that as well. If you can, you can even find it on Amazon. Um, but Charakacharya put it together, and and then after that, Sushruta uh, Samhita is uh, written by a, actually a surgeon. Sushruta is a surgeon, and so there is a lot of information about uh, surgical applications like rhinoplasty and all originated from that. Then you have the third major book, which is called Ashtanga Hridayam, which was written by Vag Bhatta, and there they actually talks about eight limbs of Ayurveda. So just like yoga, we have eight limbs, but here it's more like modern medicine where you have internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, toxicology, ENT, all of that is there. So it's a very systematically um, produced system. It's a very systematical medical system. It's not just some kind of herbal medicine or some folk medicine or you know things like that, which people have these notions. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. So it's well-founded in something. It's not just thrown together. Um, so ahara, um, vigyan is the word used for food science. Ahara means anything that is taken in through the senses. So we are using it for food here, but you know, because we eat food, but of course, anything that you watch or see with your eyes, what you hear, everything that you take in has an impact on our body, our body, our mind. So if you're not, you know, taking in the good stuff, then obviously you're going to feel imbalanced. You'll be listening to bad news or you know, violence or gossip or whatever. Those things have an impact on your health. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and the word used for health in Ayurveda is called swasta. That is such a uh, profound word because it's it's a conjunction of swa asti, meaning established in the self. So what does that mean? So in yoga, if you've heard of it, they would say, you know, union of body, mind, and spirit. It's the same way. If you're established in your pure self, your blissful self, then your body and mind and spirit and union, you're going to feel healthy. You're going to feel energetic to be able to do whatever you want to do in your day-to-day -day life. So that is very important. The goal of Ayurveda, again, is by two, uh, two lines, uh, very nicely put together. So the first importance they give for is preserve the health of healthy people. Most of us in the modern society, what do we do? We go, get sick, then we go to the doctor or a dietitian or nutritionist, whatever. But we really don't think about our health when we're, everything is going well, you're just running, running, doing 100 different things. But you really don't think about, am I reading the right things? Am I listening? Am I taking rest? Am I doing exercise? Nobody asks these questions because it's just kind of getting through the day, day to day, every day, like a routine. So that is the number one thing. So if you're healthy enough and taking care of yourself, then you have enough energy to do just about anything you want to do. So that is something important. And then of course, Atur is Vikara Prasura. Of course, if you have some illnesses and stuff, you want to cure those. So definitely Ayurveda also gives a solutions for that. So let's talk about food biochemistry. Now I wanted to just compare conventional medicine and Ayurveda. For me, that is very interesting because I was I was I started off as a dietitian and I'm still a dietitian. I would never give that up. That has been great. But also there is so much of value in Ayurveda that can be added to this as well. So conventional medicine, when you look at your plate, I mean, we always talk about the three macronutrients, right? carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and how many diets have we been through, right? So one day, carbohydrates are good for you. Next day, it's bad for you. Low carb is better for you. Don't eat carbohydrates. Then they say, okay, low fat is better for you. Then they say, high fat, keto diet is very good for weight loss and everything else. Then people say low protein or high protein. High protein is better for you, Atkins diet, right? So constantly it keeps changing with all these different studies. So people, and now with Google and social media, everybody gets so much information about all of this stuff. And most people are confused. They don't know what is going on. You know, don't know how to choose the diet. I don't know what is right for my body. So to me, Ayurveda has given me a very uh, common sense approach to looking at food. So when you look at your plate, we eat our food. We know the taste of food, right? We know what sweet tastes like. We know what salty tastes like, what is sour tastes like, bitter. So we know these things. If it's spicy, you know it's pungent. 
So we know all of this. So we actually use our senses to when we eat our food. So it is so much easier if you can figure out what taste is actually good for you versus, and if you know the qualities of these foods and their taste, it's so much easier to choose something that is suitable for your body uh, or even imbalances that you may have in your body. Okay, so one important cardinal principle that we need to think about in Ayurveda is they talk about one more sutra, Sarve Dravyani Pancha Bhautikani. So that means every substance is made of the five great elements. The five great elements going from gross to subtle are earth, uh, water, fire, air, and space or ether. So, and again, I will talk a little bit more about these elements in the next slide, but I just wanted you to understand that everything in the universe, so not just your physical body, things around you, animals, plants, food, spices, even the table and chair, they all have these five elements in them. So when you're interacting with different things around you, you want to find some kind of a balance to feel healthy. So foods, herbs, spices, they're all made of these five elements. So unless you take in something that is made of these five elements that are suitable for your body, you cannot assimilate them into your body and nourish your body with them. So that is why it is important to look at those the elemental composition of food. No food is considered to be good or bad in Ayurveda. Any food can be modified to suit your body's needs based on its properties and actions. So it's not like don't eat this and don't eat that. It's not like that. It is more about how you can adapt it to suit your own means. And all foods have the five, all of them. They all five elements are present in everything, but there is a certain predominance of certain elements in different foods. And we will talk about that when we talk about the different tastes. So let's get to the qualities of the food. Now the qualities of the food are affected um, by these elements. So let's first element is earth. So I'm going from gross to subtle. Earth is called prithvi. And definitely earth in a, in a food gives these qualities of heaviness. Obviously a food which is earthy, we always say earthy is more grounding. So it gives you grounding, gives you stability. It provides strength for the body. It helps you heal tissues of the body. Now um, in the body, when you really think about your human body, all of these uh, organs and all of these things are dominant in the earth element. Water. Water, uh, it's called jala or apaha. It is a liquid, it is cold, it is moist and mobile. Now these are things that everybody knows, right? It's not something new. Supports body's fluid balance. Uh, it gives you moisture to the body. If you have dry skin, you know you need to drink some more water. Creates satisfaction, which me and gives you taste, right? If you don't have saliva in your mouth, you cannot taste the food. So definitely it has a very good role to play. And then of course in the body, all the fluids in the body would be dominant in the water element. Fire or Agni. Now, Agni is very hot. What do you think of hot fire, right? Hot, it is sharp, it, is, it can burn you. It's dry, it's very drying. Um, it is light, it is, it aids in digestion because of the Agni. So we need heat to cook food, right? So that is what it is. So it helps with digestion, helps with metabolism in the body. So if you don't have a good Agni in the body, which an Agni in the body would be like the enzymes and um, all the hydrochloric acid, all these acids in the body, all of those are considered to be agni in the body, in the physical body. And then it maintains body temperature. It gives you mental clarity. How mental clarity? Because we have thoughts. We are constantly absorbing things in the mind as well. So we need to digest those thoughts. So even for that, you need agni. And then skin complexion. Again, the light comes from agni or fire also. Fourth ingredient, fourth uh, element is air or vayu. Vayu is again dry, it's light, it's subtle, it creates lightness in the body. It also gives clarity because air helps to clean up things and purify things and it also helps with movement. So anything in the body, you know, in inhalation, exhalation, the air movement, all the, the circulation of the blood, everything is helped because of the air element in the body. And then the last one is Akasha, ether or space. Um, it is also light, it's basically, so unless you have space, movement cannot happen light, subtle, it's clear, it's movement, and then again, feeling of lightness in the body comes from air and space. Now, these would make so much more sense when we start talking about the six days and also the body types. Um, so, and the other thing is the one thing that we use to analyze um, the properties of food, uh, there are actually six different factors, five main factors to analyze a food. So these are rasa, virya, vipaka, prabhava, and gunas. And I'm going to discuss these. These five together are called the pancha padartha. So very important five uh, aspects of food that we need to look at to understand its properties and action. Uh, 
So the first one is rasa. Rasa means taste. We said, right, shad rasa in the beginning in my title slide. So that is the sixth taste. So rasa is actually much deeper. It's not as simple as just taste. Rasa means it's the very essence of something. For example, if you're eating an ice cream, it, the quality of or sugar, the quality of sugar itself is sweet, right? So that is the essence of sugar. Or even in a person, the person gets angry all the time. That you think of them as angry is their essence, right? So like that, it is the essence of something. So rasa is six taste, sweet, sour, salty, pungent, bitter, and astringent. And I will discuss in detail about these things later on. Virya. Now the second quality of food to look at is a virya or the potency. The potency is basically an energetic effect. So when you eat the particular food or spice, what kind of effect it has on the body? Does it heat the body or does it produce cooling in the body? So that is very important to know. So if you have a heartburn, you want something cooling in the body, right? Or if you're not digesting things, well, you want more heat in the body. So that kind of, that helps you with deciding what to eat. Vipaka. Vipaka is again, it's post digestive. If again, this is a little more advanced, I don't want to go too much into detail, but I do want to mention that it is when the food is eaten or anything that is eaten, it gets modified to a, or somehow, somehow in the different parts of your digestive system. So if it is modified more in the stomach, it will give you like a, there is a, at the end of the uh, process in the stomach, it is sweet. And then in the intestines, when the bile is released, then it produces like a sour taste. And then when it goes to the colon, the water is absorbed. And then you have the stools, which is again pungent, and we all know this. So that is the taste. So based on the post-digestive effect, also food has a certain effect on the body. Prabhava. Now, Prabhava is a special effect. Certain foods, just by nature, they're made a certain way. They have a different, although they have similar properties, like for example, ghee and milk have similar properties, but ghee is supposed to be heating and digestive in nature, whereas milk is not. So that is something different. Again, this is not very easy to explain, but they're just just special effects nature has made it that way gunas gunas again are attributes of the or qualities so there are like 20 gunas described in ayurveda 10 pairs of opposites so it could be heavy or it could be light it could be damp or dry again this is, these are things i will mention again in the sixth taste it will become more clear at that time karma is again it's a, it's a separate thing so karma is this action so every food that you eat every spice anything that you put in your mouth they have a certain action in the body. And this is more useful in pharmacology to say that if this is going to help you like, to be a diuretic property, does it have a digestive effect? Does it increase your agni? All these things, we use it in pharmacology. But the same factors would be useful even when you evaluate foods and spices and herbs and things like that. So this is why food and spices in Ayurveda are used as medicine. You know, even that is considered as medicine because of all of these properties. So let's start with our first taste. Uh, madhura or sweet taste, we always start with the heaviest taste. Now again in Ayurveda also they talk about what the order of eating and I will just mention that at the end though, but sweet is what you're supposed to start with and in this country what do we do? We start with dessert goes at the end which is not the most healthy thing to do. So anyway, um, so madhura is, a, madhura is sweet which is a combination of earth element and water element. So both of these are very gross, right? So that means what? It gives grounding. So again, because of earth and the water, it has a cooling effect on the body. So when you eat things, foods with sweet taste, they're going to give you a grounding effect, they're going to give a cooling effect on the body. Vipaka is sweet, which means it gets mostly broken down in the stomach and then forms that sweet taste. So if you're eating too much, um, you know, if, you're, if your food is loaded with sweet taste, then definitely you're going to find um, a lot of bloating and it's going to stay in the stomach longer. And you're going to feel the sluggishness and heaviness and all of those things. Gunas, again, it's heavy and it's moist, you know, takes on the properties of earth and water. Food sources would be natural sugars, um, fruits, grains, most seeds and nuts, oils, meats, and dairy products. So all of these are very heavy and sweet in taste. So 80% of the foods that we eat are sweet in taste. Um, karmas, it, it um, gives nourishment to the body. It promotes growth of all the tissues. It improves complexion. Uh, it uh, gives you a healthy skin and hair. It strengthens the body and it gives energy, vigor, and vitality, right? So even when you go for like a workout or something, we say you want to have some carb loading, right? That's also a sweet taste. So that it gives you that uh, vigor and vitality to go ahead and um, uh, give you that grounding and okay, energy that you need for the exercise. So the second taste is amla or sour. The amla or sour taste is, again, when you look at uh, the combination, it's a combination of earth 
and fire together. So here, earth is still there, so it's grounding, but then the fire adds a little bit of digestibility to it, okay, agni. So the heating obviously is going to be, I'm sorry, the virya is going to be heating because of the fire element is added on there. And vipaka is sour. Because this is sour, it is going to be digested more in the um, intestinal part where the bile acids all come in and then break it down further. So naturally, if you're going to eat too much sour taste, then you, it's going to get digested more in that, that area over there. Um, and if you eat too much sour, too many bile acids, then you might have the heartburn and those kinds of problems start to happen. The acidity starts to happen. The gunas, it is very light, it is moist, it's hot, it's stable. Food sources, again, acidic foods, citrus fruits, fermented foods, yogurt, cheese, kimchi, vinegar. These are some of these examples of sour foods. Now, as far as action is concerned, it's very metabolic. Obviously, anytime when you have fire, it's going to give you the metabolism. It's going to help you digest better. It improves your digestion by increasing the agni. Carminative effect, meaning it will reduce gas uh, and bloating. And it's also digestive and it helps to remove toxins. And when you have fire, again, it helps to detoxify the body. Mind level also, it helps you digest things. It digests uh, ideas and, and learn things and increases comprehension, helps with discrimination, whether it's good, bad, no, what is the difference, gives you that clarity and sharpness of your mind. Sour taste. Again, you don't want to have too much sour, but a little bit is definitely very important. The third taste is lavana or salty. Now, lavana or salty, again, everybody knows what salty is. It is a combination of water and fire. And the, the virya is heating quality. Again, because of the fire element, it is going to have a heating effect on the body. And vipaka is sweet. Um, and gunas, it is heavy, it is moist, it's hot, stable. And it's a sweet vipaka, may, meaning it will be digested mainly in the stomach. So you know, you know that water bloating also happens because of that, right? The food sources, again, are sea salt, Himalayan salt, tamari, soy sauce, seaweed, rock salt, sesame salt. All of these are good sources of salty taste. Now it is anabolic in nature, it purifies tissues, it is digestive again like I said because of the fire it's going to be digestive but again moderation is a key. You don't want to indulge yourself too much, salt is not good for you so you have to avoid excess salt but you do need some salt. It has a lack, can have a laxative effect, it can maintain, it maintains water balance in the body. In the mental level also it gives you confidence, it gives you enthusiasm and zest for life. You don't, if you eat salt free all the time you're just not going to feel good enough so you do need that. Sometimes you're tired and you're running and doing things, you do crave salty snacks. It also creates a lot of desire. So that's why when you eat one potato chips, you cannot put it, put the bag away. You want to finish the whole bag of potato chips because it creates that desire in you. So you want to be very careful when you're eating salty things, not to indulge yourself in that. Okay. Okay, the next tip, did I miss one? Uh, yeah, I think I went to the previous slide. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, the next one is pungent or katu. It's called katu. Pungent again is, um, it has a heating media. Uh, it is heating to the body. So pungent would be, uh, again, the, the vipaka is pan, um, also pungent, which is in the colon. So too much of uh, spice is not that great, but spices are very important because it does have the fire element. Because it has air also, it is very light, it's dry, it's mobile, it's hard. Uh, hard meaning it dries things out. Um, and then food sources, all of the spices will be considered pungent. Onions, garlic, radish, some herbs and peppers are considered pungent. Karmas, again, improves metabolism, it reduces congestion and increases digestive power. It increases, you know, a lot of times we say, you know, inhale some ginger. When you're doing some inhalation, it will loosen up the kapha that you have or the congestion you have in your chest and things like that because the pungent taste has that quality. It liquefies any kind of phlegm or um, congestion in the chest or even sinuses. It purifies the body. It removes um, fat. It helps with the scraping effect of fat. It also, it, I mean, some hitas have said that it kills sperms and ova in excess. So the shukra that, that again, that is a little bit more um, uh, to do with the tissues. Again, in the mind level, it can lead to extra extroversion, gives you vitality, vigor, and clarity of mind. Again, pungent kind of gives you a jump start when you're feeling sluggish or something like that. Then you eat a little bit something spicy, it just wake you up, it wakes up your um, sinuses and everything else. You feel a little bit more energetic because of that. So the next taste is tikta or bitter. Now bitter taste, again, in India, we are used to bitter quite a bit. And again, bitter we think of as always medicine, right? But in here, I, you don't see a lot of bitter vegetables. 
Um, but, but bitter is a combination of air and ether. So both are very light, air and space. So naturally it is going to have a cooling effect on the body. It, the vipaka is of course pungent. So because it is so light, it is digested more, it has a pungent vipaka. Gunas are again light, it's dry, it's mobile. The food sources, again, like I said, the bitter melon is very common in India. We used to get it in Indian stores here also. There's also a Chinese bitter melon, which is not quite as bitter, but the Indian one is much more. But bitter melon is very good taste to have. Um, of course, you can always modify it to suit your taste. And then turmeric is bitter. Mustard, and that's why it is so medicinal. It has such a medicinal property because turmeric is bitter. Then mustard greens, kale, collards, all of these um, greens which are bitter in taste. Uh, coffee is bitter. I mean, again, I'm not talking about making these lattes with the sugar and stuff. I'm talking about the actual coffee and then cacao. Dandelions, we can make dandelion tea. It is very detoxifying to have. Some herbs and spices are also bitter. And that is why they are very good as medicine because bitter helps to um, detox the body quite a bit. So that is the first karma, detoxifying the body, kills germs and strengthens immunity. It has an anti-inflammatory property. Uh, we know that about turmeric, there are lots of studies about that. And then it's dry and it helps with reduction of fat. And it also helps to lower um, blood sugar because it is the opposite of sweet. So, and then the mind level, it causes aversion to a life and then cause uh, aversion to desires. It causes isolation, introspection. Again, this is only when you're eating too much of it. Um, not when you, you just, and a lot of the yogis and stuff, you know, are known to do that because they are in a different plane, different kind of goal in their life. Now, again, turmeric is very important. I and mean, we talk so much about turmeric and it is always better to eat it as a food in your cooking or, you know, as a spice rather than getting some capsule with curcumin because you're there, you're just taking that active ingredient and giving it to you. You get so much more from turmeric because flavonoids and stuff like that, which is actually healthy for the body. So it is always go, good to go with a natural food rather than to go with any kind of supplements. So the last taste is kashaya or astringent. Now, again, this is not necessarily a taste that you will taste in your mouth, but it's more of a property that it has the capacity to uh, suck the fluid out. So uh, it has a cooling virya, it cools the body. It is a combination of earth, which is, a, which is also cooling and air is also cooling. So naturally it has that cooling um, effect on the body. Vipaka is pungent. Um, gunas would be heavy and dry. Some of the examples would be like raw bananas, you know, the green bananas or the plantains, you call them. And then the apples, um, dried beans and peas, uh, like kidney beans and black beans and all of these beans and lentils, these have that astringent property. So they actually have that, that's why you need too much of that, they pull too much of fluid and then you feel bloated and stuff like that. So of course there are way to, ways to modify that so you don't have that kind of problem. Then pomegranate is an example of astringent food. Uh, tannins are like coffee and tea, they have astringent property and then popcorn is also astringent um, or corn. Uh, it, improves, it improves with absorption, it binds stools. So when you have like a diarrhea or something, you eat an apple, apple actually has pectins, which is a soluble fiber. So definitely it pulls that fluid and binds your stools, heals ulcers, it's anti-inflammatory in nature, it's the congestion, the scraping of fat. In the mind level, it's supporting and grounding, again, because of the earth element. Excess will lead to scattered mind um, because the air element goes up, then you're gonna have that anxiety and fear and insomnia, those uh, some problems with a scattered mind. Um, or brain fog. So, and when you look at the tongue also, the, they've been, they've, they have designated areas for these different tastes. So when you eat a sweet or a pungent or whatever, immediately your body gets the signals uh, through the, from the tongue, what kind of acids to release, what to enzymes to release in order to digest that food. So it is amazing how our body is so well made and if you start understanding it more, um, then you will know exactly how to help. You give the right conditions so you can actually help yourself and heal yourself on your own. So some of the key principles, three key principles I would like to bring up. Of course, there, again, this is just a brief overview. This is not whole of Ayurveda, obviously, but it's just something very important to know. Agni, I've been talking about Agni as an element before, but now I'm talking about Agni as a fire or a digestive fire. So Agni helps to Di transform complex substances into simpler forms and digest. So when you eat something, it is broken down, right, into carbo and, and modern nutrition, carb, protein, fat, whatever. So, it's, so you need that. That metabolism is so important. We all know it's very hard to lose weight when your agony is not working or your metabolism is not working. It's impossible to lose weight. I mean, most people are obsessed with losing weight. Um, I shouldn't say the word obsessed. You know, 
they think about weight too much. And I really don't even talk about weight that much. I always look at the health of the person rather than go talking about health because that actually causes a lot more anxiety. But anyway, so it is very important that we, we, are, uh, we have a good agni in the body in order to uh, digest whatever we eat. So um, in Ayurveda, it is not just what you eat, but it is also what you digest. Now you may go out and buy the best food, the most organic vegetables and fruits and all of the stuff that you're eating. But if you're not digesting your food well, if you don't have a good agni, there is no point in spending all that money. So first thing you need to work on is improving the digestifier. And ama is the second. So when you're, when you're eating, um, you keep on eating and your digestion is not good and you keep adding more and more food to that, then you're gonna create a lot of toxins. And that is called ama in uh, Ayurveda. Ama is like this white uh, sticky substance, just like, you know, you think of it like the cholesterol, the plaque that uh, clogs up the arteries. It's sort of like that. And that kind of ama can form in the body and block the channels and uh, prevent tissue formation. You can you have, can have ama on the mental level also if you're stuffing stuff and your emotions, you can also have toxins that way. And even that can play in, um, uh, you know, have an impact on your agni. And again, the third concept, very, very important is like increases like. So any property, suppose um, suppose earth element is dominant in your body and then you put, put more earth into your body, like eat more sweets, which is earth, then you're just going to increase that kapha, kapha. Again, I'm going to talk about body types. It'll make more sense over there. So let's go to the body types. This is the most interesting that most people like to see because they want to see themselves in these body types. Um, so vata body type, there are three body uh, types described in um, Ayurveda. The first one is called Vata body type. Now again, remember we're all combination of all five, but the dominance is air and earth in these people. So usually Vata types are very skinny. They're really tall, skinny with long, small face and little eyes and long hands and fingers. And they have, everything is fast. The personality, they're always fast. They talk fast, they eat, they talk fast, they move fast, they eat, you know, they're always talking constantly. They're very enthusiastic. You can see that Vata energy is always like so enthusiastic. They're also very creative. They can come up with hundreds of ideas, but they may never follow through on any of them. They might start a lot of projects, never finish anything, but they'll keep going. And even in their friendships, they'll have seasonal friendships. In their jobs, they'll keep changing jobs. It's always about change all the time. Again, that's just a little piece of what I told you. There's so much more to it. And sleep, when it comes to sleep, again, they're very light sleepers. They're always fresh in the morning, but they have many dreams. Um, when it comes to their agni, their digestifier, it's called visham agni, meaning irregular. So some days they're really hungry, famished. Some days they just don't feel hungry, they forget to eat. The memory is very poor. They say lots of things and they'll forget it the next day. So it's very hard for them to remember because of, because of constant movement of air, nothing stays long enough. So the common imbalances with the vata person is constipation, because again, it's dryness, right? So it causes constipation, causes gas and bloating, colic pain in children. You know, you always say there's a stomach is, their pain because of that. Pain is always associated with vata. Dry stools, skin or hair is all the vata. Then aversion to cold weather and or wind, windy weather, food allergies, and then joint pains, usually related to vata because of the dryness. The nervousness, anxiety, the mental level, insomnia, all of these, and then PMS, the mood swings, anything that swings back and forth is all created vata. Now vata energy in the body is what helps to move everything in the body. So anything that the, the air moving in the body, the blood circulation, everything is controlled by this vata energy or the kinetic energy in the body. But these people, what they really need is, because they are a combination of air and ether, we want the opposite. Remember I said like increases like. So if you're, if you're gonna eat a popcorn, this person, which is, which is a combination of air and ether, they're gonna get even more imbalanced. So they need to do something that is opposite. So the first taste you would suggest is salty. Again, not in excess, remember that causes desire, but definitely salty is important because it gives you the water, which will help with the dryness, and it gives you the fire, which will help with the heating of the body. So salty taste, sweet taste, now they need the grounding. So you give the earth element, which is sweet. So it helps you ground yourself. Again, I already gave you the food sources for the sweet. And then the third one, of course, is sour. Again, it's a combination of both earth, which is grounding, as well as a fire, which is heating. So these are the three tastes which are very really suitable for a vata person or vata imbalanced person. So it doesn't mean that you have to be born this way. Sometimes you can also have vata imbalance because you've been, you know, like very busy with work and not forgetting to eat and 
eating all the wrong foods and snacking all day and doing all kinds of things, you can get your vata imbalance. If you're too much stress in your life can increase the vata as well. So then you have to really take care of yourself um, by choosing the right kinds of foods. The second body type is Pitta body type. Um, this one is a combination of fire and water. Now, Pittas are, the, you can think of them as like the type A personalities, right? They, because of the fire, they, they, and usually they're moderate frame. You can see they're a little bit more muscular uh, frame wise. The face is um, kind of in between. The, the, the angular face is usually Pitta, the green, blue eyes, all the colored eyes and the hair. All of that is related. So anything with the color is related to that Pitta because it comes from the Ranjaka Pitta, which is all about color in the body. And then um, personality wise, they're very intense because of the fire. So very passionate about it, very intense. So it is a little bit hard to take for somebody who is kapha grounded to being with a very pitta person is a little bit more ten, you know, especially vata would get really, you know, burned by that. So definitely, you know, it is nice to recognize that in different people to understand their personality and, you know, and they're also very perfectionist. They like to be, have everything perfectly organized. Everything has to be a certain way and their way is the only way and, you know, that kind of thing. They're very intelligent. They love to argue. They are very argumentative. They have to prove their point and don't, you cannot really try to convince them otherwise because they're very, um, they can be, if the pitta is very imbalanced, they can become very fanatical also. Uh, they're very visual learners. So they, everything is through the eyes. Alo chika pitta is a part of the eyes. And that is, so anything to do with vision and seeing is all related to pitta. And eye, eye problems are also related to pitta. Sleep-wise, they are sound sleepers, seven to eight hours, not that deep, but not as, uh, you know, uh, restless as vata either. Um, and their Agni is, again, because of the fire, fiction Agni, sharp Agni. So they, that means what they have really good digestion. Now think back to when you were maybe younger, 20s, 30s, you were much younger, even in the teens, you were, you know, you knew what hunger was like. As you get older, hunger becomes a thing you have to really pay attention to, right, sometimes. Um, so, but when you have that sharp hunger and you have to feed that hunger when they're your uh, digestion is so sharp because, it, and they usually get angry if they don't get their food right away. So that is very important to remember about Pittas. Common imbalances, usually heartburn, anything to do with heat in the body, right? Heartburn, ulcers. If you get, keep letting this heartburn build up and build up and burn the system, then they're gonna end up with ulcers and then they can have loose tools, hemorrhoids, rashes or skin inflammations are related to Pitta. All of these skin diseases, psoriasis and all those things are related to Pitta, eye burning, uh, light sensitivity, the very sun, like I said, the visual thing, and headaches, aversion to heat, um, frequent anger and frustration, because if things are not going their way, they get angry and frustrated, and then they go, and again, that just aggravates all of their physical symptoms as well. And again, greed. Um, greed is, again, that is also another imbalance on the mental level. Um, and for them, the best taste would be sweet, right? Because sweet is cooling. So it is earth and water, it's cooling. So they're already so heated up, First thing you do to quench the heat is put some cold, put some ice cream on there, right? Slap some ice cream there. So that is a sweet taste. Bitter is a combination of air and space. Again, that makes them a little lighter and then cuts down the intensity and cools them. Again, that is also cooling energy. And astringent again is another cooling energy where the earth element and the air, both are cooling energies will help them cool the body a little bit. So kapha body type, again, Third type, they are a little bit on the chubbier side, a little overweight maybe. Um, they have a larger frame and they usually have a round face and beautiful eyes and then they have lots and lots of hair, really thick, abundant hair. Um, but they're very, also very slow in movement. They slow, they move slowly, they talk slowly. They have very, very sweet voices and they actually have beautiful voice to sing. They're very grounded people because of the earth and water element. And, and because they're very grounded and they're, you know, the thing is there, they have the inertia to move. So they're not interested in moving. You want them to do exercise, it's good for them, but they don't want to move. So the best thing is if you, if you can, if you relate to this kind of a personality, the best thing is to do exercise first thing in the morning, just make it a habit and do it. And then, then at least you'll get good start for the day. They have excellent memory. Think about an elephant. Elephant is kapha and it has, amazing memory. 
So it's like that. So anybody who's a kafa constitutional, and they're also very loving and affectionate people. Um, but if they do have an imbalance, it, it, could, um, it could lead to a lot of depression and attachment and possessive and those kinds of issues. Uh, Sleep-wise, they're very sound sleepers. They can sleep long hours. They have very difficult uh, time waking up in the morning. Now, even the, the day, time of day is classified as vata pita kapha. So the morning 6 to 10 is a kapha time. So that is a heavy time, right? So naturally, they're very, it's difficult for them to wake up during that. They're already kapha and then they're waking up at this time. And then, of course, if they wake up before the kapha time, there's a little bit, it's vata time, which is actually better for them. And then um, to, uh, 10 to 2 is called pitta time. So that is our lunch time, right? That is around noon is when the sun is overhead and the, the, the agni is burning. The best time for, for us to eat a good meal. So that is a pitta time. And then, of course, 2 to 6 is a vata time where activities, say vata is all about activities. That is the best time to do all your productive work and all of that stuff. And then evening 6 to 10 again is kapha time. So it kind of goes in a cycle. That is, so that is a time to unwind and relax, and have time with the family, enjoy evening. Of course, eat a light dinner because you don't want to eat um, too much at a cup of time. And then again, 10 to two is, at night is again pitta time and you're digesting your food, you're digesting your thoughts, everything is happening. So you definitely don't eat at that time. You want to give that time to digest it. That's why I always say people, go to bed before 10 or at least 11 o'clock because if you're staying up till 12 o'clock, you're going to go for a midnight snack. So definitely don't want to do that. So their agni, when you talk about the digestion, it is very slow. It's called mandagri. It's very low appetite. So the cravings for heavy or sweet foods is always there and they have a tendency to carry excess body weight. So if you are a kapha person, it is okay to accept that that is, that is the way your nature made you and that is okay. There's nothing wrong. As long as you're healthy and taking care of your health, it doesn't matter. Common imbalances, loss of appetite, feeling of heaviness, sluggishness, nausea, congestion in lungs, uh, lethargy, aversion to cold and damp weather, um, craving for sweets, desire to eat frequently, um, and depression and attachment and difficulty to get motivated. So these are all kapha imbalances. So, and this, this applies to anybody, not just the person born with the kapha type, but anybody who's experiencing these skills should know that you have a kapha imbalance and then eat according to that or you know, change your lifestyle according to that. So the foods which are perfect for this. Now again, it's earth and water, so we want the opposite, right? Like increases life, so we want the opposite. The first one would be pungent. Pungent is air and fire. So it is heating and drying and makes you lighter. So you want to feel lighter. So the pungency actually gets you a start, gets you moving. When you're really down, you need to move. You eat something really spicy, it will really wake you up, right? The bitter taste is the next one, which helps to detox. So um, because eating too much sweets all the time can build up a lot of kapha in the body. So you want to, um, you know, get rid of that. So bitter helps to detox, which is air and space element. And then the third one is astringent, which is earth element. It does have earth element, but it also has air elements. So it kind of helps to, uh, you know, dry out the fluid if there's a lot of fluid in the body. And so it helps with that. Again, you don't want to overdo that either because of the earth element, but definitely that'll help with any fluid balance in the body. So Agni, I've been talking about Agni so much, it's probably the most important thing to remember. Um, what are some signs of a healthy Agni? So how do you know you have a healthy Agni? First of all, you have excellent digestion, right? You will have those feelings of hunger. Most people, when I ask them and I talk to patients, they say, oh, do you feel hungry or do you just eat on time? They say, oh, I just eat, I don't feel hungry at all. And a lot of people don't feel hungry in the morning. And if you don't feel hungry in the morning, you don't have to eat. You can actually just skip breakfast and go to an early lunch at 11 o'clock because this way you get your body to digest whatever is undigested. And then you eat a good meal for lunch when you actually feel hungry. Because when you're feeling hungry, your actually agni is burning, which means what you're ready to cook your food. Um, so agni is um, normal elimination, proper tissue formation, good circulation in the body, you have high energy levels. So if you want to go out and do something, you have the energy to do it. You're not dragging yourself to do things. So you have a strong immunity, so you don't get sick very often. You have a good complexion, um, you know, like a luster, like you're glowing. You have that glow about yourself. Pleasant body odor and breath, intelligence. You're pretty sharp. You're able to grasp things well. You have a lot of enthusiasm and you have good perception of things. You have a proper perception of things, not like a distorted perception of things around you. Signs of unhealthy agni, usually low appetite, you have low energy levels and energy comes and goes in spurts, you're not able to really do what you want to do, the constipation because you're too dried up in the body or diarrhea, the opposite, bad body odor, bad breath, low immunity, 
a confused perception, brain fog, all of these are some symptoms of unhealthy agni. So what are some causes of unhealthy agni? First of all, eating at inappropriate times. So I mentioned the pitta, vata, kapha. So the kapha time is the, the sluggish time. So you want to eat a light meal, very light, and it should not be sweet because sweet will increase kapha, right? So you want something spicy in the morning, but it should be a very light meal. Then lunchtime, pitta time, your, that should be your main meal of the day. So that time you want to have a balanced meal with all the six tastes and, and sit down and enjoy your meal. And I will talk about behavior modification at the end. And then of course, uh, like I said, vata time is just activity time. So if you really have that craving at three, four o'clock in the afternoon when you're working too much, then good time to have some fruits because that'll help you ground yourself and help you with the vata from getting out of hand. Or you can have a few nuts with some spices and all of that in there. So that will also help you um, kind of get yourself moving again. And of course, dinner time should be very light. Again, it's kapha time, so light dinner, like soups or more vegetables and less of the other sweet tastes. Most, more vegetables with fiber and things like that, and a little bit spices for sure to help you digest your food. And then you have, um, uh, and then under eating or eating highly processed foods. And now that is a big problem with our modern societies. Too many foods are processed. People are these, just go buy stuff, heat it up in the microwave and eat it. Definitely, there is no prana in them. There is no life in those foods. It's almost like eating dead food, which is cooked God knows when. So it's always have, good to have a fresh meal prepared, even if it's a very simple thing, like a little casserole with just some you know, vegetables and some protein and fat and, and, and some um, starches. That's good enough, like a casserole. So you don't have to make elaborate meals either. But it's better to have always freshly cooked as much as possible. And this is good for your whole family, right? And the kids also learn from how you serve them. Eating before the meal, the previous meal is digested. Now, if you know you have not digested your meal and you still go and eat your next meal because it's time to eat, it's not a good idea. It's better to give your body some rest so you can digest the rest of your meal. We are all not in a famine. We're all well to do. We can always get food anytime you want to. So it doesn't mean that you have to eat it because it's time to eat. Excessive sleep. Now, sleeping too much is not good for digestion. Anger, grief, any of these emotions, negative emotions will impair the agni, will quench the fire. So definitely we want to have uh, better ways of dealing with those kinds of things and not to stuff them, but to let them out and deal with them appropriately. Immoral behavior, consumption of excessive fluids or the frequent changes in dietary habits. You know, people go from one diet to the next diet to the next diet, body does not adapt so easily. And every time, like for example, if you go on a low calorie diet, yes, initially you might lose weight if you have a lot of weight on you. But then what happens, the body says, okay, wait, this body is starving. I need to adjust because I'm not getting enough food. I'm in a famine, I need food. So then they'll start slowing down, slowing down your metabolism. So the body is a lot smarter than us because it has the mind, the body, every cell in the body has a mind. It knows, it has its own intelligence. So you really cannot cheat, cheat your body. Of course, as long as you have good intelligence in the body, it will help you, give you the right cravings. But once it loses its intelligence because of the poor agni and everything else, then the cravings are usually not healthy cravings. Suppose you're craving sweet at 12 o'clock at night, you know it's not a healthy craving. Um, so one more concept in Ayurveda, it's called some yoga, incompatible food. Now this is very unique to Ayurveda. We've not seen it in modern medicine. We don't say don't combine this and that and all of that. But here they talk about very clearly that fruits should be eaten by themselves. So fruits take only about an hour, hour and a half to digest. It's all carbohydrates and it should not be eaten in anything else. But remember, fruits are very healthy. Although it is raw, it is healthy because it is, it is um, nature's uh, gift. It has been ripened by nature. The, the sun has given it the energy to ripen it. So naturally, it is going to be good for your body. But it should be eaten in between meals and not with your meal. So what is a typical American um, breakfast in the morning, right? It's fruit parfait with all these fruits and yogurt and granola bar. It all sounds wonderful. And you think, wow, this is so healthy for me. And after you eat that, you don't feel good. You feel sluggish. You feel bloated. You feel, so that is not a good way to start. But if you feel like, if you don't feel like eating anything in the morning, you just want to have a little bit of berries, that's also fine. You don't have to eat a big meal. So that's very important. Again, milk cannot be combined with yogurt, fish, meat, melons, cherries, sour foods, because again, the different properties will cause a lot of indigestion and decrease the agony in the body. Yogurt should not be combined with fruit, milk. Again, smoothies, think about all the smoothies, how they combine these things together. And the nightshades, nightshades would be like potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, and um, what's the other thing? Uh, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, eggplant, four things. And then of course, yogurt should not be combined with eggs or fish. 
Um, we make omelets, you always put egg and milk together, not a good combination, it's better to just put some water. Eggs, again, not with dairy products, fruits, fish, or meat. So these are some things to remember. Of course, definitely use a lot of spices in your cooking. Doesn't mean like spicy in the sense like cayenne pepper, but like more like ginger, black pepper, cumin, coriander. Those are all some good spices. I've also made a YouTube video on spices specifically for people on a low sodium diet. It's on YouTube. It's a made kidneys in the kitchen. And then I've talked about all these different spices and their properties with the taste and things like that. I mean, the heating quality and all of that and how to make these spice mixtures. Um, and I've given a few examples. So that's something you can go and, and look at also to learn more about spices and how to use them. And last, um, I just wanted to touch upon some of the rules for eating. This is called Upa Yoga Sansta. So rules for eating, very important. Um, and again, in the Western modern uh, medicine or modern nutrition, we talk about behavior modification. That's become, you know, we do that more now. Nowadays is more about mindful eating and things like that. When I first started 30 years ago, that wasn't a thing. We only talked about the food and the food groups and stuff like that. But anyway, um, the first thing is of course, eat only when you're naturally hungry and previous food is digested, very important. So how do you know this? You have to be mindful. You have to listen to your body. You have to ask yourself when you go eat something, am I really hungry? Do I really need this food? Sometimes when you're thirsty, also you might think you're hungry. You drink a glass of water and then you may not be hungry. It was just the thirst. So the second thing is food should be fresh, freshly prepared and warm and hot. Because when you eat warm, hot, freshly prepared food, there's so much of prana. And prana is our life force. So there's prana in that food. When you see a fresh fruit, you feel like it's, oh, this so, looks so good. You are, you know, automatically start salivating because the body knows it's good for you. So you want to try to eat as much as possible. Of course, it's, I know with everybody's busy schedule, it's always not easy to do that, but at least not, you know, eat one week old food, maybe eat it by the next day or something like that. 10% um, of the time, maybe you, you have to slip up a little bit, but at least 80 to 90% of the time, if you can adapt to that, that'll be a good thing. Um, caution again, cold raw foods. The raw foods are never advocated in uh, uh, Ayurveda because raw foods again takes a lot to digest. You need to have a very, very strong agni, digestive fire to digest it. Um, pittas usually have a strong digestion, so they can usually handle it if, if it is normal, if it is balanced. Summertime, maybe some salads and stuff is okay. But usually if you look at it, even in Ayurveda or in, in Indian food also, we, we don't eat like a bowl of salad, like eating like a whole lot of lettuce and spinach and then putting some vegetables and fruits in there. But what we actually do is we, we would shred carrots or cucumbers or whatever, and we actually put some mustard seeds and put some spices in there, we put some lemon juice and salt and all of these things. So it actually helps with digesting that raw food instead of eating just plain raw carrots with, with the ranch dressing, which is just, you know, very hard to digest. So eat um, food, again, Ayurveda says, eat only one third stomach full. One third should be filled with water and one third capacity should be free. So you don't have to eat uh, com you know, completely full stomach because then you're not able to digest your food. It's going to, it's going to cost a lot of ama and, and digestion. So definitely eat less. Um, and uh, healthy plate, again, healthy plate in Ayurveda, it has to include all six tastes. So for first taste, now there you start with the sweet taste, then the sour and the salty, the heavier ones you eat first, then you eat astringent at the end. And if you've been to any Indian restaurant, you would have seen they have fennel seeds, right? These fennel seeds have that astringent property. And what they do is when you eat that, it actually helps with digesting your food. And at the same time, it dries out the saliva in your mouth. So you don't have cravings later on. Whereas if you sit and eat a rasagula or a chocolate cake at the end of a meal, you're gonna have craving, the insulin is secreted right away and you're gonna have craving within about an hour. You're gonna eat food. And so that is something to keep in mind. So if you, and I always tell my patients, if you have to eat a sweet, if you have a craving, eat your sweet with your meal, don't eat it separately. That's very important to remember. Timing of the meals, very important. I already mentioned this before. Uh, the, the time, the morning is kapha time, so light meal. Lunch time is the main meal of the day because that's when the pitta is high. And then you have the dinner time, again, kapha time, so lighter meal like soups and things like that, which are warming and um, more liquidy for, for kapha. It is good for kapha. Again, if you remember this proverb, if you've heard of this proverb, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a papa, right? So remember that always. That is how we are supposed to be eating. That is an old English proverb. Um, always eat slowly and chew your food. That is something we forget to do. And in this day and age of all this technology and, and you know, the, the emails and all the stuff that we keep, we keep in touch with, 
people tend to sit on the table and then look at their phones, look at their iPad or watch TV sometimes, or while you're driving, you're eating. None of that is really healthy for the body. So if you, if you can't spend 15 minutes to put the right fuel into your body to keep you healthy, that is the most important thing. I mean, we eat three meals a day or at least, at least two meals a day for sure. You want to give at least 15, 20 minutes for yourself to just take a break, relax, and make that like a ritual to enjoy your meal, taste the food. Because once you do that, your whole body is involved in the digestive process. It will give you the right uh, enzymes and everything else to digest that food. But if you're thinking about something else or concentrating on something else, your energy is going towards those things and there's no energy coming to digest your own food. There's so, sort of like common sense when you think about it. You know, there's a distraction going on. So don't eat when you're emotionally upset, anxious, or angry. That is another thing, right? When you're really upset or really anxious or you're like, so this thing, don't eat. Have a little bit of water if you have to. Just sit down, ground yourself or watch, uh, I mean, listen to some music or read a book or go for a walk in nature, something to gen kind of cool you down first before you actually eat. And this is why we, uh, Ayurveda always says you sit and pray. Say a prayer, you know, either you're thanking for the food to kind of ground you at that point, you know, and then your mind gets a little more elevated at that point. And also you kind of become more relaxed when you pray, right? You cannot be angry when you're praying. So definitely that is a very good uh, thing to think about doing whatever prayer um, or just thank you, you know, just a gratitude is good enough. You can do that. That will also help with your food. Again, I already mentioned sit down while eating, mindful eating, no distractions. Do not eat three hours before a bed idea. This is modern medicine has also started saying that now. And of course, Ayurveda definitely says because you eat a heavy and then sleep right away, you really will not get a good night's sleep and you cannot digest what you've eaten. Drink water before meals. So if you about a half an hour before meals, you can drink water. It's almost like, you know, when you have to cook something, you put the water in the stove and then you boil it and then you cook the food. So it's like that. You are drinking the water, then the, the enzymes start, I mean, the agni starts to function. Then you put the food in, you can digest. Then you can have sips of water. The temperature of water is very important. Always go with the warm water if you can. Or the worst, uh, if you're not used to use, used to ice cold, definitely get rid of the ice have at least room temperature water because it takes time to heat up this water in the body as well. So, and the body temperature is 98 degrees and you're putting 30 degree ice cold water in the body and shocking the system. It's gonna take a lot to even digest cold water. So that is important to remember. Remember water has a cooling property, whether it is heated up or it is cold, it still has a cooling nature. So any temperature you drink, it's gonna have that cooling effect on the body also. A lot of people, you go out in the sun, you say, oh my God, it's so hot. I need really ice cold water. That is only for the mouth taste, but the body, you don't need that. But you drink uh, room temperature or warm water, you will actually feel better and you won't feel as thirsty. Uh, you will digest so much better and you will quench your thirst. So sips during a meal is good. But again, after a meal, you don't want to drink a lot of water um, for at least for another half an hour to an hour because well, then you're diluting. Uh, so you need that space to digest your food. So imagine if you're cooking and then you pour cold water into that. It's the food is not gonna cook. So it's the same principle if you wanna think of it that way. And then the last one of course is after eating, you definitely wanna take a little bit of a walk or some, take some hundred steps or uh, 10 to 15 minutes, um, just go for a walk somewhere and come back. Nothing very vigorous. Then after that, you wanna sit and relax. Um, if you're used to doing yoga, you can do Vajrasana, sit in Vajrasana for about 10 minutes. It is healthy to do that. It will help you with the digestion, everything to move properly in the body. Okay, so, okay. So these are some of my references. Okay, so this is, um, again, um, that's, again, I just touched upon, um, um, I mean, this is an amazing topic. I, I just loved it because as a dietitian, I found it so valuable and uh, helping so many people with this. And I don't really talk to them specifically about taste per se, but some people I might. But the, knowing their body types and giving them what is suitable has been so much more helpful because always I work on the digestion of a person. So that is how you have to approach your body too. You look at your digestion. Am I digesting? Don't compare. If somebody tells you, oh, you eat this, this is good for you. This will make it go away. No, your body is different from somebody else. So always pay attention to your body. Body always gives you signals as to what is good for you, what's not good for you. So I think if anything you learned from this whole thing is sit down and enjoy your meal and taste all of the food and see what everything tastes like and how you feel every time you eat different foods. This can be an experiment for yourself to learn about yourself. You can even make notes for yourself and just doing that will help you heal yourself. 
Um, this is just information about myself, uh, practice as a dietitian, and uh, I have a website. I do have some recipes on there and some uh, blogs and things you can go and read. Um, and, and I have a few recipes. I also talk a little bit about Ayurveda and things like that. So something for you to learn. And the other thing is, um, I told you Gauri is uh, my co-host today. She's also my co-author. We just launched our book this week on Ayurveda and yoga. We wrote a book two years ago, actually, um, for uh, dietitians and nutritionists and healthcare professionals. Because I really believe that it's important for us to integrate you know, ancient wisdom of Ayurveda with modern nutrition because it's more of a holistic approach. And uh, I, I still remember uh, two, 2017, we had our annual dietitian meeting and Sanjay Gupta came as a, as a keynote speaker and he had just uh, shot the series called Chasing Life, if anybody's watched that. And one of them uh, segment was about Ayurveda, he's gone to Kerala and he's just said how wonderful it was. And, and he, he said this, this personalized nutrition is the need of the hour. So I think um, that is where we are right now. And I think um, incorporating Ayurveda has, um, can really help you with your own healing and health, both mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually in all aspects. It is a comprehensive approach. So we are actually having a book launch on September 12th, um, virtual book launch. So we'll have a Zoom uh, talk like this. And we are hoping to share more about our experience, how we came about this book and what all this book talks about and stuff like that. So if you're interested, we'd love for you to join us. And um, um, I guess that's...